Hey everyone, welcome to today's Stage 32 webinar. Uh, my name is Harrison, I'm the Director of Education here, and I'm so glad to have you here today for our uh, 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 webinar today on indie distribution and really how you can navigate this quickly changing field. It's been changing quickly for a long time, but especially now as we're going in and out of a, a worldwide pandemic, and I think it's time that we all kind of take a look at what's happening right now and what it means to sell your film. I think it's a different meaning than it was ever has been before. And so to do that, we brought with you someone really exciting, um, Kristen Harris. She's taught with us before. She's uh, uh, the VP of Distribution and Acquisitions at Good Deed Entertainment and has been living in this world of distribution for quite a long time and uh, knows the ins and outs and is great at talking about it. So we're so excited to have her here and we're going to get started in a second. But before we do, a few quick things. This is a live interactive webinar, which means you will all have the chance to ask any questions you'd like to Kristen. And to do that, you'll be using the questions box of your GoToWebinar toolbar. And I'd love to do a practice round. If you guys can all uh, pop open that questions box and in there in that text box section, type in where it is that you're tuning in from today, what city, what state, what country. We'd love to know uh, 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 where you guys are um, and who's in the room. And I will also remind everyone that this is uh, um, being recorded. So you will all have access to the recording uh, in about 24 to 48 hours. You'll get an email when that's the case. So if you missed part of this or if you want to rewatch any of it, you all have access for a full year. So um, be on the lookout for that. Um, and then we're social here at Stage 32. I hope you are all as well. If you enjoyed this webinar, if you're learning anything, share what you learned. Tag us while you're at it if you don't mind. We're at Stage 32 on Twitter and Instagram. Let's see Kristen who's here. Um, oh, cool, cool crowd. We have someone here from uh, Orlando, Malibu, Louisville, Kentucky, South Hi. Florida, Portland, New York, Houston. We got a we got a good amount of New Jersey's actually. Um, yeah. Ontario, Long Island, Western Canada, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We got uh, a lot of LA. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Woodbridge, Virginia, Calgary, Chicago uh los angeles yeah this is great we have we have a really cool crowd um so let everyone is here uh we're glad to have you uh oh someone's here from macedonia great um uh this is where you'll be typing in questions so please please do so whenever though we'll save the bulk of the questions until the end you can type them in at any time um, i will be back for the q a but until then i will turn things over to kristen great thank you so much harrison um thank you guys all so much for being here uh, this afternoon, uh, nearly this evening, if you're on the East Coast or on the Eastern time like myself, um, I'm joining you from beautiful Akron, Ohio, which is uh, where Good Deed Entertainment is located. We are formerly a Los Angeles company and now in LA. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to, to talk to all of you guys today about what's happening in the distribution world, how things have shifted, what we're looking towards as we're hopefully rounding, rounding a corner in the pandemic. Um, and share any insights uh, that, you know, in any burning questions you guys have, things you particularly want to know about, we'll go through quite a lot um, over the next hour or so. Um, but anything you guys particularly want to know about burning questions, please, please let uh, Harrison know and I will try to answer everything for you guys. Um, by way of quick introduction before I jump into the lecture, um, I've really spent most my entire career in the independent distribution and acquisition space. So I started at what is now Stars Media. Um, we I started in the genre space, so I worked on things like Masters of Horror, season one and two. Um, I was employee number two at Overture Films, which did a mix of mid-range budget wide releases, 20 to 30 million dollars, to smaller acquisitions. Uh, we released films like Sunshine Cleaning, The Visitor, Righteous Kill, um, then I moved over to Synodyme where I worked in theatrical acquisitions and uh, most recently had the opportunity to join Good Deed Entertainment um, nearly four years ago now to start their distribution arm. Uh, we are as a company essentially a, a boutique film studio. So we finance, produce, distribute the bread and butter of the company is really distribution. We release about eight to 10 films per year. Um, we specialize in a niche theatrical space, so we're usually releasing on between a handful of theaters up to about 500 theaters, uh, but we also have direct uh, digital distribution, home entertainment distribution across all major consumer platforms. Um, we have two labels, Good Deed Entertainment, which is more known for art house boutique fair like Loving Vincent. Uh, we recently released Lucky Grandma this summer. We have up and coming Carlos Lopez Estrada's Summertime and the Sundance 
uh, film Ma Belle, My Beauty. Um, and then on the Cranked Up label, we uh, are probably best known for Extraordinary, which we released right as the pandemic was hitting, which was super fun. Uh, we did uh, Nightmare Cinema and recently uh, a Tijuana Jackson's Purpose Over Prison. Uh, so it's we really run the gamut in terms of the types of films we release. Uh, at the end of the day, we are very filmmaker friendly. We are very high touch in how we release. We spend a lot of time creating bespoke campaigns around our films. Um, so it's really not about checking boxes. We're really about trying to think outside the box, trying to reach uh, niche audiences, trying to be really engaging and um, working in collaboration with our filmmaker community. Um, so to that end, let's jump over to our, our PowerPoint here. Um, so at the end of the day, what is what is distribution? You have, you have a film, you want to release it. So it First and foremost, you want to connect your content with audiences. The first question to answer or, or sort of hurdle to overcome is finding your audience. Um, as a filmmaker, before you even approach distributors, whether you try to distribute yourself, whether you're working with the distribution partner, having a sense of who the audience for your film is, is going to be sort of an important starting point. Um, you know, you want to have an understanding of what their behaviors are like, what their demographics might look like, um, where they tend to watch content, what types of programs, outlets, etc. Do they do they read? Are, are they engaging in, etc. So coming coming to us with a sense of who your audience is is, is usually really important. Um, particularly, at least in our sake, if they're a theatrical going audience, that's also really important. Um, it, again, distribution is about once you know who your audience is, spreading awareness to that audience, and more than just making them aware that your film exists, creating demand for that film, for that content. So it's something that they need to actually go out and purchase, that they want to go out and rent, that they want to go out and buy a ticket for on a Friday night and, and spend their evening in a cinema. Um, next is ultimately deciding whether you want to partner with with all rights distributors like the Dina Entertainment, whether you're going to partner and do sort of an ad hoc distribution infrastructure, whether you're going to do your own self-release and do sort of a DIY releasing um, structure, whether you're going to partner with an aggregator, any of those types of options are out there. But I think understanding what those options are and what your audience is and what your needs and goals are help ultimately inform the best path for your film and what's going to be best suited for you. Um, so once you know who and who your distribution partner is or what path you're going to go towards, the next thing is ultimately making your film, your content available on consumer platforms. So where people are actually renting, buying, streaming their content, whether it's in a theater, whether it's on Apple TV, whether it's on Amazon, maybe it's on one of the new OTTs, maybe it's on Netflix, maybe it's on Vudu, maybe it's a new AVOD platform. AVOD is advertising video on demand, by the way, we'll get into sort of all that stuff. You want to make your content available on as many platforms um, to as many eyeballs as possible. You want to monetize the exchange. Ultimately, you're hoping to recoup your investment in the film and make some money back. Same with the distributor. We're looking to, to keep our lights on and stay in business. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you're going to learn. You're going to learn from, from every step of this process and you know, learn from your successes. You're going to learn from your failures and then ultimately decide how you're going to make your next film and how you're going to release your next movie. Uh, okay, so what are the historical shifts in in this business and specifically thinking about independent distribution because that is that is my specialty. That's where I come from and I'm assuming most of you guys are independent filmmakers. So what's going to what's going to apply to you guys most is going to be the independent distribution space. Um, so ultimately, we've moved pretty heavily from it. And by the way, when I say independent distribution and independent film. Um, it goes sort of without saying, or when I define that, it means essentially films that are financed and produced outside of the traditional studio system. So you guys finance them yourselves, uh, and the companies that are releasing these films usually are, are independent. So we've seen a real shift from specialty labels that were intended to release independent fare uh, or, or sort of more challenging art house fairs. So, right, Universal used to have Focus, Fox had Searchlight, um, there was Weinstein Company or Miramax. Uh, so there's there's been a shift away from those studio independent labels 
and over towards uh, a more democratic uh, releasing system. So there are a lot more independent distributors out in the landscape. Obviously, streamers have emerged. There's you know, direct access to some of these consumer platforms directly for filmmakers. So we've seen a democratization of, of accessibility for content. We've also seen a massive reduction in the cost of, of filmmaking. You're able to make, you know, get gear, get quality equipment and make a film that looks that looks professional for a heck of a lot less money. Um, obviously, we've seen the emergence of new players in the distribution game. We are seeing new consumer platforms and new streamers all the time every day, particularly over the past year. You know, it's like we've seen Disney Plus emerge. We've seen Paramount Plus emerge. We've seen HBO Max emerge. Uh, we're seeing a lot more AVOD players that are entering the market. Um, and we've seen things like virtual cinema, uh, which I talked about the last time I, I did a stage 32 discussion. So if you want to learn more about virtual cinema, you can check that out. Um, but that, that landscape has shifted a little bit as well. Um, and we're seeing a shift in the ancillary market from physical goods, like the good old brick and mortar DVDs when you went out to Blockbuster and, and rented your movie over to digital consumption. So instead of having a physical library, you have a digital library of content or you're streaming your content and you have um, subscriptions versus uh, catalogs that you, you own. Um, I think the next point kind of explains itself like look we're clearly seeing a consolidation we're seeing um studios like warner try to vertically integrate again you know releasing their own ott labels to compete with netflix um and it's it certainly sh you know shaking things up and it's it's messing with uh theatrical windows and maybe that's good maybe that's bad but it's certainly causing us as an industry to, to rethink how we're doing business. And that's always something that we're gonna be dealing with in, in indie distribution. I, I would say that if you if you get into this game and you're not okay with change, you're in the wrong business. Uh, I think every five to six months, we see some tectonic shift in the way we do business in how windows are changing, how technology is shifting, and it makes this, this business incredibly exciting. Uh, but we have to stay on top of it. It means we have to be forward thinking, uh, which is why I appreciate how nimble Good Deed is in that we're able to take advantage of some of these shifting um, shifting technologies and windows and, and apply them for our own releases. Um, so what are we seeing in this post-pandemic world? Um, at least right now, we're starting to see theaters open back up again, which is hugely exciting, particularly for a company like us that loves the theatrical experience. I think, you know, we saw an, an enormous wave of, of OTTs. And when I say OTT, guys, I mean over the top. It simply means that it's a distribution platform that does not require any kind of like cable or other subscription. You, you can access this simply through the internet, right? And some of them are free, some of them you pay a monthly subscription for, etc. Um, but we saw a ton of studio OTT platforms emerge. We saw a lot of AVOD, we saw a lot of consumption at home while everybody was quarantined, while everybody you know couldn't be out, while we couldn't be together. And I think that now that people are starting to get vaccinated, um, the exhibition landscape is slowly but surely starting to open back up. Um, we saw LA really um, really open back up with a vengeance which is incredibly exciting so uh we were i, I think as a, an entire industry really interested to see how godzilla versus kong was going to perform particularly because it was available in theaters and at home so consumers had the option to see content in the comfort of their own home or actually go out to a theater and i think how well that film performed given the fact that it was available in both manners was was really encouraging that people really miss the theatrical experience they miss being together and even if it's different now even if their theaters are at a reduced capacity um i think that we we're going to start seeing at least in the next six to nine months uh, the theatrical world to sort of come back slowly but surely and hopefully back to 100 percent seating capacity soon um, and then ultimately the, the other big, I don't know if it's a problem, but it's certainly something we deal with is just the flood of product. There's a ton of independent films released every year, thousands of them. Um, 
literally released every year more than a you know a film a day so with that much content out in the world how do you how do you get your film found how do you find those eyeballs how do you find those audiences and get your film noticed um so that's definitely a central question and problem that we're always looking to solve um okay oh sorry let's go back um, so what are people watching? I think in particular right now, people are, are tending to watch, and I'm just speaking thematically, they're, spe they're watching content right now that feels nostalgic. They're watching content that feels optimistic. They're, they're looking for escapism. They're looking for laughs. Um, I, I think that heavy dramas are not particularly working really well right now, um, unless they're really topical and they, there's a lot of heart to them. Um, people are watching content, you know, how are they watching it? Uh, they're watching it mostly at home. Um, though, as we just spoke about, that's obviously opening up and, and shifting as people are returning back to theaters. I think that we're seeing the traditional studios sort of shaking their boots a little bit with um, the power of streamers, like, right? So, you know, the streamers are becoming to, to some extent the new studios, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, um, really wield a lot of power in the marketplace right now. And, and those old studios know it. So I think the challenge for distributors like us, where we're an all rights distributor and not a streamer, we're trying to figure out how to, how to fit into that ecosystem in a way that feels authentic and that works. Um, so we're moving away from those historical studio monopolies into um, new media and streaming. And then what's influencing consumer consumer decisions about what they're choosing to watch on a Saturday night, what they're choosing to stream, what they're choosing to to ultimately go to in a theater. The the gold standard, I think, at the end of the day, is always word of mouth. This used to be simply, you know, an anecdotal thing. You talk to your friend at work, you talk to your buddy that you're chatting with, hey, what did you see this weekend? What are you liking? It's one of the most basic conversations I think people we have as human beings. We talk about the entertainment we're consuming. Um, and I think people trust obviously their friends, their family, their colleagues, more than any advertising they're gonna be served. So having strong word of mouth um, is, is really, is gold. That's the the number one thing that you, as a filmmaker, as a distributor, are looking for. Um, obviously, word of mouth now is is not just anecdotal. It's not just you know having a conversation around the water cooler. It's obviously amplified by social media. It's amplified by by the internet. So what people are you know chatting about on Twitter, what people are posting on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook, all of that stuff ultimately becomes becomes part of that word of mouth um, component. Um, advertising obviously is is influencing consumer decision making, hopefully good ads, ads that are engaging, that are interesting, that to some extent don't feel like ads ultimately. Um, placement and visibility is a huge, huge component in, in consumer decision making. So for example, if you go to the Apple TV um, or even Amazon Fire homepage, there's a giant flow case at the top of your screen. That's obviously gonna be you know, the place that, that garners the most attention. Your eyeballs are naturally gonna go there. You're not having to search through thousands of titles. Um, to find what you're looking for. I think what is most prominently placed in front of you by consumer platforms has a huge influence on what you ultimately decide to click or, or watch. So those platforms and how they curate and how they merchandise and how often they refresh that merchandising um, is crucial. And I think that's one of the biggest areas where, where distributors like myself, where all rights distributors actually play a role is because we can help get your content merchandised and, and seen on a lot of these consumer storefronts. Um, and quality, at the end of the day, I know that, you know, people talk about like, hey, it doesn't matter if it's not a great film, if it's marketable, if there's great elements, there's great cast, it's a good genre, it checks all these boxes, people are gonna wanna check it out. Like, yes, to some extent, but I think that quality, like a strong quality film that's really beautiful, that is moving, that is engaging, that is different, really at the end of the day has a lot of legs and is truly meaningful. Um, so even though it's not necessarily something that you can, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to articulate this. Um, 
I guess at the end of the day, you know, story, story, and a, a really good film will always speak for itself is, is where I'm heading. So what the heck does a distributor actually do? What, what do I do for a living? Uh, let me tell you. Uh, I act as an ambassador for you as a filmmaker. It's my job to essentially be your hype woman, right? That I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna talk up your films to all of these consumer platforms. I'm gonna tell iTunes how great it is. I'm gonna tell Amazon, I'm gonna tell Netflix. I'm gonna tell every single consumer platform how amazing your film is, why they should feature it, why they should license it, why they need to be you know, making it available for their consumers, why they in turn need to market it. Um, obviously, I'm going to be talking directly to consumers when I'm developing your advertising campaign, all of that good stuff. I'm going to help you craft your release strategy, strategy, right? Like, how are we looking at windows? What consumer platforms are we focusing on? What is most important? How do we want to roll out? All of those sorts of questions I'm working with you on. And then ultimately, I'm hiring the team to work with, with me to execute on the strategy that we put together. That next piece ultimately leads right into that. We're executing on any theatrical and home video, digital, et cetera, releases, initiatives. Um, and then like, look, I think that there's a misconception that even if a distributor doesn't offer you an advance, so an advance is an advance against receipts, advance against gross receipts. So your film, once I release it, is gonna earn money. We refer to that revenue as gross receipts. Um, say I'm anticipating your film is going to make a million dollars in gross receipts over the first year. What I'm going to do as a distributor, as a show of good faith, because we obviously receive, as a studio, we receive those revenues over time, right? Like theaters don't pay right away. Platforms don't pay right away. Home entertainment revenue doesn't come in right away. It takes time. I'm going to advance you a portion of those gross receipts so that you, as a filmmaker, can have some money in pocket right away. Um, but just because I'm not, maybe you get an offer from, from me. Let's just say it's me. I, I'm like, so-and-so, I love your film. I think it's great. I'm not able to offer you in advance, but here's a straight distribution deal from us, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't mean that I'm not advancing costs because, um, because ultimately what you would have to do if you were self-distributing versus going through an all rights distributor like us is you would have to cash flow manufacturing costs, you would have to cash flow encoding costs, a lot of delivery costs, marketing costs, which you know we refer to a lot of that as, as P&A, prints and advertising. Um, there are a ton of costs that, are, that go into just the logistics and basics um, of getting your film to those consumer platforms, to getting it delivered, to making sure it has the appropriate trailer, it has the appropriate key art, it has, you know, all of those bells and whistles you'd want your film to have um, that make it exciting to, to consumers. We are cash flowing and advancing all of those costs. And in, and in a lot of cases, it can be, you know, it's, it's pretty expensive. You know, you're talking, you know, anywhere from you know, on the low end for, for a small theatrical release, you know, five, five figures into the millions of dollars. So that's some, certainly something to consider if you are thinking about self-releasing. There is an inherent cost into that self-release. Um, it's my job to sell your film into accounts and platforms. We talked about that a little bit, right? So I'm selling to iTunes, I'm selling to Showtime, I'm selling to, to all of those platforms which we identify as potential partners. And I'm managing your film over its entire life cycle. So I'm not just releasing it and then letting it Letting it do its thing, um, you know, we're setting up regular sales, we're talking to accounts, we're getting it re-promoted, we're figuring out what new platforms we can put it on, how we can continue to breathe life into your film over over the term of its of its catalog life. So, I mean, it could be anywhere from most distributors are taking films from seven years to, you know, 20 or 30 years. So it's a pretty long pretty long like span that we're looking at how to to keep your film fresh and interesting. Um, we also have a, a pretty significant in-house infrastructure to manage all of these components, right? So we have an entire accounting team that's going to manage, you know, potentially residuals. We're going to manage your filmmaker statements. We're going to handle all the collections from accounts. We're going to chase those accounts. We're going to make sure they're paying on time, that they're, you know, we're going to set up direct contracts with all of those accounts. We're going to have software that manages your box office that reports everything. We're going to have software that manages for piracy. Um, there's all kinds of things that, you know, when you're like, oh, the distributor isn't doing anything. There's a lot of things that go into the back end of making sure that, um, 
your film is, is out and you're actually collecting its revenue that I think people don't think about necessarily all the time and, and their important functions that frankly, it's not that you can't do them. Like I think as a filmmaker, you can choose to be your own distributor. You you absolutely can. It's a matter of of time and bandwidth. Like to, I always sort of joke that like, yeah, you can stop making your film, you can release it yourself, but then you cease being a filmmaker and you have to spend your time learning and becoming a distributor. <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, it's like, I think it's, there's something to be said about letting distributors, you know, be distributors and do what they do best. And I lean on my filmmakers to, to be savvy and, and currently under, you know, understand the distribution landscape, but they're going to exceed as, as filmmakers. It's what they do best. I'm absolutely not a creative. I'm not a filmmaker, um, but I do work really hard to support those, those filmmakers, to support their voices and to execute on their creative visions. Um, and then again, we have a team of experts in their respective areas um, with well-established relationships, right? That we can call up Netflix and, and get them on the phone, that we can call up the, the head curator at iTunes, that we can call up the you know appropriate accounts and, and get answers to things, uh, which I think is, is really important and goes a long way. Um, so when you're thinking about how you distribute your film, right? Like, what are the options? Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of options, but they fit predominantly into three traditional sort of buckets. So there's a traditional theatrical release, meaning your film is gonna be in theaters exclusively before it goes anywhere else into the consumer ecosystem, right? Before it goes on to any sort of rentals, any direct purchase, any DVD, any streaming. Um, usually it's a clean, or at least it was pre-pandemic, a clean 90 day window that films lived only in theaters or were only available to theaters before they went to other platforms. Obviously now with the emergence of you know HBO Max and um, in other streamers, they're starting to challenge those those windows and, and let's see where things net out at the end of the day. Obviously studios, major studios have a lot more muscle to challenge that 90 day window with theaters than, than indies or independent uh, filmmakers do directly. Um, a lot of those types of films are, you know, films that are gonna be wide released widely. And by wide release, I usually mean films that are gonna be on 2000 or more screens. Um, right now, I don't know, I think we, there's I think approximately four, 4,000, maybe a little bit more screens total in the US. Um, so anything that's gonna take up a good chunk of that real estate. Um, so wide releases for us, art house, prestige film, review driven film, discovery films, et cetera. Um, then there's sort of a day and date model where it's a bit of a hybrid uh, where you're going in theaters and on digital uh, more or less at the same time. Um, it might also be a truncated uh, window where maybe you're in theaters for a couple of weeks, uh, but then you sort of go directly into digital. Um, so anything in that I would call sort of a hybrid or day and date type model. Um, the old old school day and date model when this was initially um, brought into the ecosystem by companies like IFC and Magnolia, there were certain parameters that had to be fulfilled by a cable company in, in demand sort of set the set the gold standard, right? That you had to be in a minimum of 10, um, of the 10 markets of the top 20 DMAs or designated market areas. So, right, like the top markets are LA, New York, um, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, et cetera. Um, so you had to be 10 in the top 20 DMAs. You had to be releasing in theater with a minimum of two screenings a day for a full week. Um, and you had to, there had to be some like newspaper ad, et cetera. Um, there's one or two requirements. Anyway, and you were at a higher, that basically unlocked the in theaters now row on cable and on digital. And for a little while, that was a super exciting thing. Um, it's become so passe now. And ironically enough, it's like, it wasn't really that many years ago that we started this. Um, nowadays, like that, that 699 model has kind of come and gone, though with the emergence of PVOD, which is right, the prime video on direct, um, it's what the companies were doing while theaters were closed and they had theatrical movies they were still releasing anyway. They were paying a pre, you know, charging a premium anywhere from, you know, 20 or $30 to, you know, $10 or so um, for sort of that day and date um, type model and, and release. I think that now that we're shifting back into theaters opening back up, we'll see what that ultimately looks like. Um, but there'll be always be some 
some version of a model where films are both in theaters and available direct to consumers at the same time. Um, last but not least, the ancillary only direct to digital, direct to video. I would also encompass this as like, you know, things that are released as like Hulu originals, Netflix originals, things that are direct to streaming. Um, so those ancillary only or direct to video titles used to have a really negative connotation that like somehow the quality wasn't there. They were subpar if they weren't getting any kind of theatrical exposure. I think that that to some extent that that model has really just been demystified, particularly by the streamers um, that have elevated some of this content and, and you know, I guess like. I don't want to say eventized it, but they've, they've you know, made it must be viewing ultimately, right? Um, so that's shifting, that's shifting the environment, it's shifting the perception of some of these titles that it's not such a terrible thing to forego theatrical and just have your film available on, on digital or streaming platforms. But historically, the content that would do really well in this sort of direct to digital or direct to video um, bucket were, were things that performed really well on home entertainment or physical goods. So programmers, you know, Nick Cage movies or like Westerns with, you know, I don't, I don't even want to name actors, but I think you guys could, could guess. Um, action films, sci-fi films, certain horror films, family and animation historically have always done really well in the, the direct-to-consumer, direct-to-video business. Um, then also uh, digitally driven content, which is like younger, right? So a younger demographic that is used to viewing all of their content on digital platforms that are also, you know, that have some level of economic freedom that they're paying for their content, but they, they aren't going to the theater as much. So sometimes there's younger um, demographic skewing content that makes sense to release direct to digital. Um, there's the SVOD originals, which I mentioned SVOD is streaming VOD for those of you guys who are, are unfamiliar. So those would be your Hulus, your Netflix, uh, your HBO Maxes, et cetera. Um, and terms that you guys might want to be familiar with uh, in this world, DTV means direct to video, MOW is movie of the week. Is that even a thing anymore? Shows my age. Um, home video, when you hear people say home video, really they a lot of times are referring to physical goods like DVDs and Blu-rays. Um, and then digital play, I mean things that are going to be on iTunes, Amazon, et cetera, available to rent or purchase on digital consumer platforms. Um, okay. So if you're talking about, or you're trying to set up or distribute the rights to your film, um, you're talking to maybe a distributor like myself, maybe you're talking to educational platforms, maybe you're talking to theaters, you wanna understand the term terminology and the rights associated with your film um, that you're ultimately setting up. So um, I'm an all rights distributor. So you can choose to do an all rights deal uh, versus distribution deal versus a bifurcated deal. So I want to explain what those things are if you see them in an offer or you hear them being talked about. So even though when I'm an all rights, technically an all rights distributor, I tend to work more in the distribution rights world. All rights really means not just the rights to your film, but all associated rights like stage rights, literary rights, merchandising rights, soundtrack rights. Uh, you guys get the picture. So technically, if somebody offers you a deal and says, I'm going to pay you X, I want all rights to your film, that just not doesn't just mean the distribution rights. It would encompass all of those other things. And look, there's, there's certainly more... It, it could be, you know, spin-off rights, um, remake rights, etc. All of those things ultimately fall into the all rights bucket. Um, distribution rights meaning means that it really pertains just to the various uh, types of releasing and platforms for to release your film. Um, bifurcated rights essentially means that I'm taking select rights to your film. Um, in that case, if I only have select rights or select platforms that I'm distributing your film on, it's important that we, we work together so that we're not stepping on each other's toes to maximize revenue and putting together the, the best possible deal. I, I've definitely seen you know filmmakers that have done, say, for example, a direct deal with a a showtime, for example, not realizing that what they've agreed to in their showtime deal greatly prohibits their ability to be on other certain platforms or when they can make their film available and, and ultimately um, has limited their, their overall grossing potential. 
Um, so I think it's to some extent, it's important to make some friends in the distribution world so that you can talk through offers that you get to understand and make sure that you're making the best decision for your film. Um, you also want to be sure about the rights granted versus rights reserved. Pretty self-explanatory, like what explanatory, what rights are you granting me as a distributor and what rights are you reserving for yourself as a filmmaker, right? Are you reserving the book rights or soundtrack rights because you're going to do that yourself or you're going to try to spin those off? Uh, distribution rights usually include theatrical, physical goods, which we've talked about, DVD, Blu-ray, uh, MOD manufacturing on demand. So basically, I'm not manufacturing a whole ton of physical goods at once. I'm only manufacturing them as they're ordered to save costs. We're looking at digital rights, which EST means electronic sell-through. Uh, IVOD, which is usually rentals, AVOD, advertising video on demand, OTT, over the top. Um, and then a lot of times that digital rights will include the right to digitally bundle with physical goods. So you might buy a DVD and as part of that DVD, it also includes a code where you can download a digital copy that you would have in your library. It includes TV VOD or cable VOD. Um, so right, like in-demand DirecTV, AT&T, Ubiquity, um, what other um, cable platforms are out there in the world. Um, in-demand is like a lot of, it's like Time Warner cable, Xfinity, Comcast, um, all those kinds of services that would be connected to your, your television cable subscription. Uh, pay TV, pay one, pay two. So pay TV traditionally used to be the pay channels, right? Your HBOs. Um, pay one, rec it actually refers to the window, the first window in which a studio like myself might sell those pay TV or streaming rights. It usually occurs between 60 and 90 days after your film has hit street. And by street, I usually mean when it's first available um, on digital platforms to rent, to buy, et cetera. Um, a lot of streamers are, are messing with that first pay one window um, and they're wanting it to, to come closer and closer to the theatrical exposure. Um, as a pay two is the second window. So it depends on how long the first term is. And then after that first term expires, you usually have a second pay window. Um, SVOD is streaming VOD. Streaming VOD for clarification can happen. Like you can do an SVOD sale during pay one. So say I sell your film to Netflix uh, 90 days after it's made available on Amazon and iTunes. I've done an SVOD deal to occur during the pay one window. Fun times, right? Uh, linear TV or broadcast TV, traditional TV windows, so old set-top boxes. Um, your film is available on TBS at 9 p.m. Um, VR and AR is uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, not a ton is being done in this space right now. The studios were using this as a marketing tool a bit. Um, we'll see where this comes back. No one's really figured out how to effectively monetize it yet. Non-theatrical is a really big catch-all bucket that includes cruise ships, airlines, educational rights, hotels, institutions like hospitals um, and prisons, military bases, community screenings, etc. cetera. Um, there's there's a libraries, there's a ton that goes into that non-theatrical bucket. Clip rights is a tricky one. So um, usually studios will ask for clip rights. When they ask for traditional clip rights, it means the right to monetize a clip of your film. So for example, I could sell a clip of your film to Taco Bell um, to include in one of their ads and make money from it. Um, a lot of times for in, on the independent side, clip rights aren't given to studios, we get usually clip rights for promotional use only, meaning I can cut a clip from your film and use it um, on social media. I can launch it with a with a, an outlet like iTunes or a Dread Central or something like that. Um, hopefully that wasn't a whole lot. What are the uh, distribution landscape and central questions? So how should I assemble and pa package my film? I think keeping an audience in mind is a is a big deal and understanding where your audiences are. Like, does your audience go to a theater or do they really only stream their content? Are they, do they have purchasing power? Are they renting? What platforms are they renting it on? So keeping that in mind and like if you say, for example, are making a horror film and you see a lot of similar horror films on Shutter, for example, which is a great streaming platform for um, genre content, 
if you're packaging a film, you might want to be, you know, doing some research and seeing what Shutter is up to, trying to develop some relationships over there so that when your film is ready to sell, you can hopefully, you know, think about doing a direct deal or you at least know a platform that your film is going to do well on. Um, how do you know what the appropriate release pattern for your film is? A lot of that changes on a sort of a day-by-day -day basis. Um, I'll usually work directly with filmmakers to think about, you know, what the current marketplace looks like, what the, the, the health of the theatrical market looks like, uh, what theaters are likely to, to book the film, how it's likely to pay, play based on, you know, a competitive analysis. Um, but based on certain, you know, genres and categories, sometimes you get a, a good idea of, of how your film might perform and where you want to focus your efforts. Um, how can I start to curate my audience now? I mean, this is one of the biggest things for me, and I think most important pieces that I, I try to, to preach to filmmakers. Just because your film is not sold, even if it's not made yet, it doesn't mean you can't start marketing it and curating your audience. Uh, distributors and platforms love to say no. We see a ton of content and it's a knee-jerk reaction for us to say no or to pass on a film. But the more ammunition you guys have as filmmakers to prove to us that there is an audience for this film that is excited for it, that has purchasing power, um, the more likely it is for us to say yes. So if you are starting Kickstarters, if you're starting um, email lists, if you're starting social media pages and you're garnering followers, you're talking about the process of making your film, you're engaging your followers and you're building that audience, it, it makes a huge difference when it comes to selling your film because a lot of the work is done for us or at least gives us a great starting point so that we're not having to start from scratch. Um, there's a lot of ways that you guys can do that that don't necessarily co cost any money. It's just ultimately time and, and creativity. Um, who are the players in the distribution landscape, right? So in terms of, and I think this is one of the biggest things, like if you have a certain type of film, like understanding who the all rights distributors are and what we specialize in, um, it's going to go a long way. When I get approached with films by filmmakers who have done research about my company and know a little bit about my release slate and think that their film is a strong fit for me based on what we've done historically, they are so much more likely to get their film reviewed by us or taken seriously because you've actually taken the time to do some research. In the same way that you guys want us to take time to watch your film, read your script, we really love it when filmmakers have done their research on the distribution landscape and kind of know who the players are, right? So it's, you know, folks from Sony Pictures Classics, Roadside, A24, Neon, Magnolia, IFC, um, STX. I mean, there's there's tons of us. Greenwich is doing some really cool work. Um, I mean, Lionsgate um, is a bit of a mini major. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I apologize to any of my, my colleagues and friends and other distributors. Um, there are lots of us, but certainly there are lots of resources um, that you guys can find to, to learn a little bit more about um, who the players are in the landscape or, or frankly even just go to like the recent discoveries line on, on Apple TV. That's where a lot of indies live. Um, or the indie page on iTunes and see what films you love, see what films are similar to your film and then go back and see who released those films. So like go on IMDb Pro and who released these three films that you think are very similar competitive, uh, comparative titles to your title. And then you may want to try to approach that distributor, whether it's Good Deed Entertainment or Cranked Up or, you know, Shutter, whomever. Um, having that information in your back pocket is, is a big deal. Um, I think there are particularly after the pandemic, fewer and fewer all rights distributors, particularly that are playing in the theatrical landscape that do like heavy curation. Um, so I think that we are, you know, we're in good company. And I think that, you know, folks that have been fiscally responsible that really take care of their filmmakers have, have certainly succeeded. Um, oh, other examples of, of good companies, uh, Vertical, uh, Momentum, Freestyle, Gravitas, all, all a whole bunch of, um, of independent distributors that have long track records that, that do a nice job and, and ultimately have specific release patterns or models that they excel in and that they work well with. Um, and then who are the platforms? We've talked a little bit about this already, right? But um, it's, you know, platforms like iTunes, 
that is really known for like, look, I think there's tons and tons and tons of content on iTunes that's available. Um, but what iTunes is really known for and what they do well is that they really heavily cure, like curate their storefront um, with human beings that actually think about content and place it strategically. Um, there's also Apple TV, which right is sort of the streaming partner of iTunes. So iTunes technically still exists. Apple TV a lot of times is taking worldwide rights to films. So they will do theatricals and then they want content that has worldwide availability. Um, Netflix obviously is, is global. Hulu is a, a big streaming platform. Um, HBO Max has emerged. I mean, there's a there's a very lengthy list. The other transactional platforms that are um, that are interesting in dominating the market. Aside, from, so I would say that like look, iTunes and Amazon. So Amazon is both rental um, purchase. You can purchase DVDs from them, and then obviously there's Amazon Prime Video where you can stream content directly. They also have IMDb TV, which is their AVOD. Um, division of the company. All of those different businesses within Amazon are, are different. They're um, curated by different groups um, and they have different rules, restrictions, regulations. But between iTunes and, and Amazon, I would say they probably encompass 75% of the revenue um, market, if not more. And um, the other platforms include uh, Fandango now and Vudu. So Vudu used to be the transactional arm of Walmart, V-U-D-U. -U. They were actually just purchased by Fandango now. Fandango, the theatrical ticketing site, Fandango now, technically same umbrella, but different sites and companies. Fandango mm -hmm. now is where you would rent or purchase um, content in the same way you would on um, IMDb, or sorry, not IMDb, Apple TV or Amazon. So Fandango now and Voodoo have now consolidated. They're now the same company. Um, I'm trying to think what other big, of course, it like is blanking on me right now. Uh, Tubi is a big AVOD platform that's that's doing a ton of business right now. Pluto TV is another AVOD platform um, that, that has been around for a while and is really doing well. Um, those are, I think, are the the biggest players. And then cable, as I mentioned, in demand, DirecTV, AT and T, Ubiquity. Ubiquity actually hosts um, a whole bunch of small local regional cable operators. The biggest accounts under there are is really um, Verizon FiOS, uh, which is in the northeastern United States. Um, and then also Altice Cable Vision, which falls under the in-demand umbrella. Um, and then I mentioned, I think, DirecTV, AT&T. Sorry, guys, I'm going off the top of my head um, in my memory when I'm thinking about accounts. I think those are those are most of the key the key platforms and accounts that we we sell to and where consumers are buying most of their content. Does that mean those are the only platforms? No, no. I mean, there are so many. OTT apps and so many new stores, it's, it's literally impossible to navigate all of them. Um, but those are those are kind of the, the historically situated platforms. Um, we mentioned the pay TV guys, Stars, for example, we actually really love Stars. We do a ton of business with them. Shout out to all my fam and friends at Stars, um, Showtime, HBO, uh, Netflix, Hulu. Uh, who else is big? Shutter does a great job. They're wonderful as well in the um, in the genre side of things. Um, Mubi is a, an art house streamer that's been picking up a lot of steam lately. Has been doing some really interesting stuff. Um, really, like do your do your research. Like the, it's such a uh, literally it could be Harrison a whole other hour and a half long discussion talking about each one of these platforms and breaking them down as to how they operate and what their audiences are. Um, but those are the 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 key folks that I think you guys should should know about and be familiar with, play around on their infrastructure and their their landscapes, see how they set up their home pages, see how um, what types of content they feature um, and what those storefronts ultimately look like. Um, what should I know about me negotiating my deal and delivering my film? Ultimately, please be sure that you know delivery is a, a gigantic job in and of itself. Make sure you have budget set aside for delivery because the cost of delivery is is almost always on the filmmaker. So please be sure you have, you know, if you do a deal with a filmmaker, you're like, yay, great, I've done a deal. It's going to cost you anywhere from, you know, eight to 
15, $20,000 to deliver your film, depending on how many assets you need to deliver and, and depending on what the technical specifications look like. Um, be sure that you have somebody who can help you negotiate the, the deal and understand some of the industry standards. Make sure that things like um, the distribution fees are inclusive of subs. Right, so that they're not a ton of sub distributors on top of that, that you're getting charged not just distribution fees, but also those sub distribution fees on top of what you're being charged. Standard distribution fees are usually between like 15 and 30 percent, um, give or take, depending on how much money is being spent on an advance, depending on how much money is being spent on a theatrical exposure. Um, distribution terms are often between seven years and 30 years, as I mentioned. Um, and it's pretty, pretty normal for distributors to take a back end split. Um, if you're negotiating a direct deal with a streamer, their terms are usually anywhere between 12 months and three years, depending on what they're putting up for a license fee. Um, ultimately, the interesting thing about working with an all rights distributor versus a streamer is at least with an all rights distributor, you'll have more uh, visibility into how your film is actually performing versus with a, a streamer, you really won't have a visibility into how your film is, is doing. Um, and where is the future of indie distribution heading? I'm hoping right now it's heading back to the theater. <laughs> I think people really miss that experience. Um, I think we're we're really missing the communal, the communal day to day. But we've really learned that streaming is here to stay. It's going to be a, a huge piece of our ecosystem. So how we how we play with Windows and how we're flexible, um, people really are going to have the option, I think, to watch watch content however and wherever they choose. Um, and I think what's good news for theaters is I think a lot of people are still going to choose to go back to theaters. Like there's just something so magical about sitting in, in a group of straight with a group of strangers in a dark room and watching content. Um, and then under, very briefly, I know we're, I keep looking at time. We're almost at five o'clock, gosh, five o'clock my time. Um, so about an hour. Uh, understanding the rules of festivals and markets. Festivals a lot of times are an important launch launching pad for for films. I know that right now in in COVID times, festivals have have lost some of their sparkle. Um, I think some of the urgency and the exclusivity of those festivals it just doesn't feel the same in a virtual world. My prediction is that the first festival to be back fully in person will probably be. Sundance. I know Cannes is planning on having some version of a in-person hybrid. I don't know how that's going to go. I think Toronto is still planning on having a hybrid version. I, I none of the distributors I've talked to are necessarily planning on going. Um, but it, it still is important. It still definitely carries weight. The most important festivals and markets, if your film launches at one of them, that it it definitely means something um, in our eyes in terms of quality. Um, Sundance. South by Southwest, Tribeca, Can, TIFF. Those are definitely the top five. Um, but that not being that being said, there's a ton of film festivals in the world, really wonderful film festivals that can help garner word of mouth and buzz. And quite frankly, a festival distribution can also be a really nice uh, revenue earner for your film. So a lot of times festivals, particularly the smaller ones, will pay festival fees um, in order to screen your films. And that's another thing that that all rights distributors can help you guys um, navigate um, is negotiating those deals with festivals um, and knowing what to ask for and knowing what is what is standard and what other films are getting. Um, timing on non-theatrical really depends on um, your film. So airlines, for example, usually will go similar to when your street date is going, but you can do you can do festival screening in the middle of your theatrical run. You, you know, when do you do educational, which is usually 60 days after your initial digital street date? Um, when would you put your films available for cruise lines, et cetera? These are all questions that um, if you're doing a, a release yourself, are a little trickier to navigate, but certainly, a, you know, having somebody in your corner that's either a consultant, right, and working with you, um, or working with a, an all rights distributor can really help um, time all of those things so that everything is aligning like a nice little release symphony. Um, Canadian exploitation, uh, the next piece on this slide, uh, usually is aligned with the U.S. release. So usually we want the U.S. and Canada to go just about at the same time. Maybe Canada goes a, a week or two after. Um, the timing for theatrical pitching and booking, um, usually minimum of eight weeks before you actually release is when theaters 
historically, right, are committing their screens. Um, but as far out as possible, like I got, you know, some theatrical commitments for a summer release that we're doing um, a month or two ago, essentially for July. So they can be anywhere from, you know, four to six months out. Um, but for pitching, uh, for ancillary timing, usually all the cable guys want finished art and trailer and a full set of materials 120 days before your release. So it's, a, and they only, the cable guys are really particular. They're only taking pitches one day a month. Um, and you have to hit within that, you know, 90 to 120 day booking. Otherwise, they will basically say their entire month is already sold up. It's the same thing for, you know, Redbox, which we, gosh, we didn't even talk about Redbox in the kiosk world. Redbox is actually a business that saw a pickup during the pandemic because people were at home. Um, but they, Redbox is also moving into the transactional world. Redbox, in addition to having all those kiosks, is also doing... Uh, Kristen looks like um, you might have expanding their their something. Avon world. So again, love to my friends at, at Redbox. You need to have your art. Oh, how, did I? My yeah, back? I think you just like at least for me. I don't know if anyone else saw that, but it, like like maybe my ten back, seconds or so. Oh, sorry about that. Um, let me wrap up. I know we're running a little bit over. I'm gonna try to try to speed this along. Um, so yeah, I mean, ultimately you need to have those key assets, your trailer, your art done, usually ideally minimum of 90 to 120 days before you're planning on being available on digital platforms. Uh, domestic and release, uh, domestic and international release timing is going, you know, I think it used to always be that the US, North America would release first, international would follow. I think more and more we're seeing the emergence of the international market, particularly the Chinese market that's releasing almost before the US or at the same time. So it's, you know, everything is sort of stabilizing and, and going at the same time. And then at the end of the day, being so, so um, aware of your marketing and publicity efforts that if you're, if consumers can't find your film, it's, it's such a huge hurdle to overcome. So being available on storefronts, having publicity, having word of mouth, having some level of advertising spend out so that people can find your film, that they know it exists, that they know to go search it out, you know, setting appropriate goals, getting your assets in line, knowing the deadlines of when you need to have your assets, um, reaching your audiences and trying to put together a smart advertising budget. So finding consultants or distributors or partners that can help you put together something in a plan that makes sense. Um, working with appropriate uh, publicists. So national publicity covers LA, New York, you know, national footprint, and then field publicity covers regional markets. So you can um, work with amazing publicists, um, all of whom's rates are negotiable to, to try to make sure you get your film reviewed, that you're trying to get into LA Times, New York Times, and you're getting earned coverage. Um, and yeah, and you're finding like people that you're you're comfortable working with. So at the end of the day, those are that is the top line of what's happening in, in the landscape. I apologize, guys, that I feel like there's a lot we could have gone into in, in greater in greater detail, but uh, I'd love to take a second to answer any specific questions that you guys might have or things I maybe didn't touch on that you wanted to know about. Yeah, amazing. I mean, you touched on a, a lot, Kristen. That was so jam-packed with so much information. I, I think there's just so much value in that I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, <clears throat> very impressed and very, very grateful that you did that. Tony just, just wrote, I'm blown away to the level of your knowledge, Mrs. Harris, thank you. And I, yes, I think that was really, really fantastic. So thank you so much. Take a, take a breath, take a drink of water. Well, I know you guys like, towards you, you're like, how fast can I speak to get this all in? <laughs> guys, this is what happens when you have like, you know, 15 or so years of like non-sexy information that you start just <laughs> gathering. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm glad that happened. That this was this was fantastic. And and um, I will just for people who came in late, just just to um here I'm gonna get rid of the share screen for um people who are late. We're gonna do a questions and answers section right now. If you would like to ask questions, you can do so with the questions box of your GoTo webinar toolbar. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll try to get to as many of those as possible. Also, if anyone wants to ask a question live. Um, and feeling brave and wants to use the microphone, you can raise your hand with that hand raise button on your toolbar. It looks like an outline of a hand. 
uh, and I will do my best to unmute you so you can ask your question to Kristen live. Okay. But it's whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you prefer, raise your hand or type a question in the questions box. And we've already gotten a lot of questions in, but uh, hopefully we'll get some more um, as well and keep this keep this going for you know 20 or 30 minutes or so. Great. Um, let's see. Um, I have a question here from um, Lydia. Lydia said, uh, how does a film make money from streaming deals? Can you go more in depth on the actual payment structure of a, of a streaming deal? Sure, so there's two primary types of streaming deals. So predominantly, say if, if Netflix is gonna buy worldwide rights to your film, they pay, and I know I mentioned advanced rights. So advances are usually what's done by an all rights distributor. A streamer will pay what they refer to as a license fee. So they are licensing the right to your film for a specific term. Um, that's usually a flat fee. And a lot of times that is all the money you will ever see. So if Netflix straight up buys worldwide rights to your film, you'll get your license fee and handshake all done. That's that's it. Um, other platform streamers, so like even AVODs or, or other smaller streamers are doing rev share deals where ultimately you're paid um, a certain portion of revenue based on the number of minutes that your film is watched or based on the number of ads that are watched for your film. Um, so particularly for Amazon, that, that percentage of what you're paid based on minutes is really nebulous. Um, but it, as much as that's sometimes a little bit of a scary thing to not have that burden in hand with the, the license fee that you know you're earning, um, the rep share deal actually gives you, as a filmmaker, some level of control over your film. Because usually with a rep share model, you do have insight as to how your film is performing, um, how many minutes are watched, what kind of activity it's seeing. Um, and you can actually advertise for your own streaming link um, and to its availability on those streamers. So you can actually have to, to some extent have control over your own destiny. Um, so for example, we've had films that we've you know pitched to all the streamers, we've not been offered the license fees, right? The street license fee deals that we would have hoped that we feel you know were worth, worth it. And then we've gone the route of doing non-exclusive rev share deals and ultimately have seen more money um, because we were willing to take that rev share gamble and put a little bit of marketing dollars um, and effort behind those releases. But those are the two primary models. Got it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, this is a question from Keith. Um, how would producing partners work with a distributor to raise capital when in the development stages of a project? Keith has a finished screenplay and a short teaser video and treatment with a small budget of 2.53 million. Yeah, can you actually, that's a great question. Can you go a little bit more into the development stage and how distributors can work with uh, filmmakers during that time? For sure, for sure. So I think that a way that we work with producers or filmmakers when films are being developed, they're being packaged. Um, look, we usually want at least a couple of elements attached. I usually will want a filmmaker or producer, a small you know, portion of the budget, um, a sense of some cast lists and depending on you know, what our business model is, we might decide to invest. Uh, we might decide to put in some of our own equity. We might decide to more likely pre-buy your film, meaning we will um, we'll pay a guaranteed amount for the distribution rights during a term, but we're not gonna pay that out until you actually deliver the film to us. So then you take that paper or that deal that I make with you and you go get a loan against that guaranteed pre-buy. Um, another thing that we do is called a backstop agreement, which is a little bit more flexibility than a pre-buy. Um, a backstop essentially offers a, a minimum threshold of an advance that I would put up against your film. So usually in your instance, right, you'd submit your script to me, you'd submit all the information. I would run numbers and comps based on what I estimated to be not the best version of your movie, not like the spectacular wide release version, but like kind of the mid range, maybe like lower the, the not amazing version of your film and how much money I think that's gonna make. So based on that calculation, I might make you a backstop offer and say, great, um, once your film is finished, I will pay you say $500,000 and I will have the first opportunity to, to match 
any other offer you get, and you will also have the right to shop your film for a specified window of time. So then you as a filmmaker can go off, you can do a loan, basically you can debt finance that that backstop offer because you know that in worst case scenario, that is what you're gonna earn from a domestic distributor. Then you still have the right once your film is finished for, you know, again, you'll work out this window, you can, you know, premiere at Sundance or whatever, right? You can work with a sales agent, you can shop your film for, it's usually between 60 and 90 days or so, solicit offers, and then you have to basically get your best and final offer that hopefully, right, would be more money than I offered you, but you're also not gonna waste time, right? So you're not even gonna worry about soliciting offers that are gonna come in less than what I've already offered you. But say you get A24 and Lionsgate, both of whom have offered you a million dollars and 2.5, whatever. You're gonna basically bring me your best and final offer. And then I have the first opportunity because I backstopped your film and we're already cool, right? We're partners, we feel good with each other. There's a comfort level. I will have the opportunity to match that best and final offer and take the film off the market. Or I can say, cool, that's awesome you got that offer. I don't agree with that assessment and you can go off and, and sell your film and I will earn what's known as a kill fee, which is usually a percentage of the money I guaranteed you. So whatever bigger offer you take, you need to make sure that you're not only recouping that, but also that kill fee you know you have to pay out to us. So um, yeah, hopefully that, that makes sense in clear math. But those are a couple of different structures in which we, we work with distributors. So you may wanna, Talk to distributors and find out if they do pre-buys, if they do backstops, if they, you know, are are engaged in any of that kind of activity. Yeah, amazing. That was really helpful. Thanks. Um, I have a hand raised here from Tony. Tony, if you unmute yourself on your end, you can ask your question. Hey, how you doing, Miss Harris? Tony Rodriguez from Chicago. Hey, Tony. Good to meet you. Oh, excellent. Could you please refer to those elements beside the script you would expect to see if I were to contact you by email? You need a short trailer, correct? The script. No, Why I think it's marketable. Uh, yeah, I would say like usually you want if it's just the script and it's not a finished film, I'll want obviously as much information as you have. So a logline, a synopsis, any kind of um, deck that you've created, like a a financing deck, an investor deck that you've put together, any sort of tone and mood reels you've put together. Um, any competitive uh, analysis that you've looked at? So if you have ideas of, of comparative titles that you think are similar in the marketplace that you know have performed well in the box office that have been financially successful, um, you can include that. Like basically the more ammunition uh, you can give any, any distributor or any partner is gonna be helpful for us as we're making an assessment for, for your film. Excellent. Thank you, Miss Harris. Obviously, budgets are a big, budgets are a big one too. And any ever come ever come to Chicago, I owe you lunch. Oh, my pleasure. I love Chicago. Actually, I have family there. It's a great city. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for so much. I am I am blown away by your level of knowledge. Oh, one okay. more question: Is there a terminology that you use? There's some place I can go find the terminology you're using so much. Uh, I think the PowerPoint should should be available. Harrison has it, so certainly you can you can demand that. People use different terms though, so but those are the most standard, uh, the standard ones that are sort of out that people use. Thank you for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Tony. And I. Hello, oh, Harrison. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I was muted. Um, Thanks, Tony. I was saying I, I will include this PowerPoint as long as Kristen's okay with it, along with the recording. Um, so that'll be in your Stage 32 account um, uh, probably by tomorrow. So you'll be able to download that and, and, and review it. Um, let's see. We have a lot more questions coming up. By the way, if anyone wants to ask a question like Tony, again, you can do so by raising your hand. There's a few more hands raised, which is great. I'll try to get to you as well. But we do have a lot of uh, written questions coming in, so I'm going to try to balance those. But Feel free um, to raise your hand at any point, and I will try to get to you. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Samantha asks, now that Amazon Video Direct is no longer accepting unsolicited materials, are there any other recommended platforms that, that um, people can explore? 
self-publish uh, platforms. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I would say that the Amazon, the Prime Video Direct self-publishing piece was a was a blow to a lot of people. So it's been a little bit of a blow to distributors as, as well, quite frankly. Um, you know, there's not, there's not another, I think, platform that as is as comprehensive and user-friendly as that sort of um, video direct self-publishing model. You can always go through aggregators if it's sort of a pay-to-play type model, right, where, you know, you really want to control your own destiny, you're willing to put up the money for your release. So there are, there are certain aggregators like Bitmax, for example, um, which we actually use them as a lab. Um, and they're wonderful. I actually really like them, but they do in Giant. I know um, who's another great lab. They have they have a distribution uh, infrastructure as well that's accessible to, to filmmakers that want to do self-releasing. Um, let me think of any others off the top of my head, but yeah, I mean, and for, for better or for worse, right? Amazon was was the biggest one. And so with that door shut a little bit, I think that the problem was that there was just such a huge flood of content that a lot of these platforms wanted to have more curation of their content. So they really wanted and want to continue to try to work um, more closely with distributors directly um, versus working directly with individual filmmakers. So I think that's intentional on in the case of some of these platforms. And I think something that's gonna become more and more um, prevalent for better or for worse. Awesome. Um... Let's see. Sorry, there's a lot of questions coming in. This is this is great. This is an interesting one from Juan. He said, um, at times in investors want a distribution deal in place before investing. How would the pitch to a possible distribution or dis distribution person change between that but from an unmade film and a made film? I'm not entirely understanding the question. Sorry, can you repeat it? Sorry, yes. Let's see. At times investors want a distribution deal in place before investing. How would the pitch how would the pitch to a possible distribution person change from an unmade film? I think they're, I think they're saying, I think one's asking, how can you, what's the better way to pitch your film before it's made versus after it's made to a, to a distribute distributor? Well, I mean, look, once the film is made, we see the film. We, we know what the final product looks like. Uh, we can run more concrete numbers. Um, but if you're looking to position, um, I mean, obviously it sounds like the question has something to do with positioning for investors. Um, sorry, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this question. I'm not entirely sure what the objective is, so I don't know the best answer to give you. Um, obviously there's more, usually more, I guess, potential upside before a film is made because the, the possibilities are sort of limitless, right? Um, but if your film is already made, it's not premiering at any major festivals that hasn't been picked up by a, a major sales agency by which by the way we haven't even talked about the role of sales agencies and all of this like right CAA or Endeavor content coming on and representing your film and helping getting it sold all of those th things would would indicate that you're going to potentially get a, a higher license fee or a larger sale um I don't know it's uh it's a good question I wish I knew the exact answer to some I'm sorry, I don't know the best way to answer that. No, no, no. I think that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's let's do some more though. I, I have a hand raised here from Yaw. Uh, if you unmute yourself, Yaw, you can you can ask your question. Uh, hi, Kristen. Thank you so much. This is great and highly informative. Um, I'm producing a TV show. I know you didn't talk a lot about television, but this show has a potential for a huge international audience and also merchandising. Uh, so my question is actually two um, two way. How would you advise me to structure the distribution deal with the distributor, and then also how would you ideally value such a television show? Sure, uh, TV is is a hot market right now. People really want uh, television. I, I think particularly the streamers, right? So I mean, I would it's the streamers who are really pre buying shows or are. Um, are buying more on concept rather than like the traditional um, TV model, which is right. You sort of get picked up, you make or you make a pilot, and then you try to sell your pilot. Um, the streamers are really looking for the number of of hours that they can keep consumers 
on their platform. I think for for consumers or for streamers, it's all about minutes watched and keeping people in the same ecosystem. They want you after you finish watching that show to watch the next episode. They want to keep you in that ecosystem to 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 never leave the Netflix platform or the Hulu platform or the Amazon Prime platform. Um, so they'll value it based on similar shows. They'll value it based on the number of minutes or numbers of hours. Right. So like if you have a, a really lengthy um, series, it potentially is going to be more valuable versus something that's, you know, a, a mini series, like, you know, three to five episodes. Um, it's going to be valued based on, you know, the budget and level of cast um, and certainly sort of commercial viability. Right. Like how how many eyeballs they think they're going to be able to get on it. Um, another big thing to take into consideration that streamers think about when they're looking at content, um, anything that we as consumers think about being, uh, you know, slow burns, or I think there are films that a lot of times we love, things like The Witch or things that, you know, maybe take a little while to get into, but there's a huge payoff. Um, uh, streamers really want people to be hooked in within the first 10 to 15 minutes. If nothing significant happens in the first few minutes of a script or a show or a movie, it's very likely that a streamer um, or one of these platforms is not going to come on board because they're going to lose those eyeballs out of that ecosystem. They want to keep your attention. And if anything is deemed to be too slow, um, they're not going to they're not going to go after it. Um, so I think that having having pacing like issues like really is going to be a big deal for them. Um, so all that's going to go into how you, how it's ultimately valued and particularly if, if platforms are looking for localized content and there's not a lot of it, if they don't already have a, a ton of a specific kind of, or, or a genre of content, um, they're going to value it more strongly. Certainly a lot of the streamers are really looking for localized regional content, um, because there's not a ton of it. Um, so I can't put a dollar amount specifically on anything for you. And unfortunately, my expertise is, is not in the TV world. I really come from the feature world. Yeah. Um, but that's that's the anecdotal feedback I've got for you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I really yeah. appreciate this. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Uh, okay, great. I, I, I have a few more questions for you if you still have some time, Kristen. Yeah, sure. I've got about another five, ten minutes. Perfect. Um, this is a question from Cynthia. She said, can you explain how when someone watches a free movie, quote unquote, um, on Amazon Prime, how much the, distribu the distributor gets from Amazon and how much the filmmaker gets from the distributor? Because there's no upfront fee from consumers. Is it much less than traditional PVOD? Uh, that is a complicated question, my lady. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so it's really ultimately whoever the rights holder is of the film is going to get paid a certain number of cents per minute watched. So it could be anywhere from one cent per minute up to close to 10 cents per minute. And that number is dictated through a very mysterious algorithm and formula only known to Amazon that they will never share with anybody. Um, <laughs> ultimately, the distributor or the filmmaker, whoever is putting the film directly on the platform is going to get paid. And I'm using Amazon as an example here is going to get paid on a monthly basis for all the films that are on their platform. Um, and then if, I mean, look, if, if you put that film up directly, you'll get paid that monthly, you know, fee per minutes viewed. And um, if your distributor is getting paid, then they will have that revenue fall through what is known as your traditional gross receipts waterfall. Um, and the way that works is any revenues that come in are actually received by the distributor. First and foremost, they're going to take their distribution fee off the top. So that 15 to 30% fee is going to deduct, be deducted first. After that, they will recoup yeah. any uh, distribution expenses and P&A expenses. So say I've spent $100,000 releasing your film, I will recoup that $100,000 next. Um, and then after that, I will recoup any advances that I've already paid you as a filmmaker, if any. So once that is fully recouped, we'll go into what is known as the back end split. So that's like maybe anywhere from 70, 30 to 90, 10. Maybe there's no back end split, but say at the end of the day, we've gotten all this money from Amazon. We're fully recouped, right? Like all, all of that money has trickled through. What is left at the end of the day, if there's $10 left and there's an 80, 20 split, I will 
take $2 and remit that $8 back to you as a filmmaker. So that is a, a very quick distribution of gross receipts of waterfall. Um, it's kind of a depressing thing because you realize pretty quickly, um, even though films seem like on paper, they've been pretty successful. Once you go through that whole process of recruitment, there's usually not a ton of money left over, it seems, based on you know what, it, what things seem to have made on paper. So I think at the end of the day, that's why investors and filmmakers tend to get pretty fixated on advances because at least you know you have something and you don't have to wait for years and years necessarily for for revenues to to trickle in great um uh, thanks let's see um this is an interesting question from dominic dominic asks uh he said during covid we were able to make a create a production bubble and, and get two feature films shot they could easily be described as faith-based but i would consider them crossover would you recommend pursuing faith a faith-based pass path insofar as distribution or keep them mainstream and actually just uh, I think just to make that more general uh, can you talk about like uh, approaching films as a niche or more general or, or, or how to approach that when trying to find the right distributor for your for your project certainly look I think that I think that you want to always have targets right well, I talked about doing research and if you've made films that you think are either faith-based or faith-based crossover you certainly want to look at companies that specialize in those markets that historically have done really well, um, but I don't think you wanna limit yourself. Just because a company hasn't you know, released a ton of films in a space doesn't mean that they don't have maybe executives that have experience. So like a lot of companies maybe have hired folks that have had you know, 25, 30, lots, basically lots of years of experience at different distributors and that have experience releasing those types of movies. Just because the company doesn't have experience doesn't mean the executive team doesn't have experience. And so I would advise against limiting yourself to just the obvious pool of, of distributors. So have your targets of where you guys are really excited and would love to see your film and you think that they would do a great job, but try to go out to as wide of a net as possible because ultimately what you want is to try to create a bidding war, right? You wanna get as many offers as you can to try to, to try to drive the number up and get the best deal possible. And you're, you're gonna have that when there's you know, a sense of demand and, and right, it's all sort of psychology. Like as a distributor, if I know that there's multiple other offers on, on your film from other players, suddenly it seems all the more sexy and valuable, right? So um, yeah, keep, I would just say keep an, keep an open mind. Great. Um, this is the question we've been getting from a few people. I think it's probably worth addressing. This, this one is uh, uh, from Paul. He said, many distributors won't accept unsolicited films or scripts. So what's your recommendation to get solicited or to find your in? Sure. Um, yes, a lot of us don't. We will always say we don't. We don't accept uh, unsolicited material. The reality is, to some extent, to some extent, we do. Like we want some level of curation. Like uh, I mentioned the example earlier. If somebody really, I think, is finding the right in, right? So don't email immediately the CEO or the head of the company. So find the appropriate in, find the appropriate junior level acquisitions person or assistant who's really hungry, who does the day-to-day -day work, who's really the person who's responsible for reviewing all of the submissions. Be nice to them. Uh, do your research on the company. I think writing a very nice note um, that's very thoughtful a lot of times will get you will get you in the door. Um, or you know just doing all the networking you can in the industry. Like a lot of times, like being in networking events, meeting people, um, connecting with people within companies will help get you introduced to to the the distributor you want to meet so within your network of stage 32 friends or your industry friends if you really want to get an in at Lionsgate you know start asking them like hey have you read my script would you be willing to introduce me do you you know I think that's that's ultimately how you get in from an, an unsolicited standpoint the other the other opportunity right is to to have a production partner so if it's a producer that we know that we work with frequently we'll obviously take submissions from producers that we know we'll take submissions from managers um that we know um and then agents obviously so you know getting getting your script in front of any of those types of people can help open the door for you to to distribution partners I think it's really helpful. Um, let's do one more question before we start wrapping things up. Um, this is a good question. Uh, it used to be for 
it used to be that for a filmmaker to get investors, they need to sh uh, show them a sales sheet. This was done by a sales agent aligning sales prices with markets. Do these sales agents still exist or is it the distributors who now give you these figures? Uh, international sales agents still do estimates. Uh, traditional all rights distributors really, we, we don't, we're really hesitant to put numbers because they're, they're estimate, they're, they're guesses. And like, we never want to be held accountable to like guesses. And, and quite frankly, I think a lot of them are, you know, excuse the French, they're, they're, they're BS because they're trying to sell you as a film, you know, this, uh, they're selling themselves as a sales agent. They're selling themselves as, as a distributor to say like, look at how much money I can potentially make you. Uh, because they want to win the film and it doesn't necessarily align with the realities of the marketplace and then at the end of the day you you oftentimes end up with really disappointed investors who are like but i had this sheet and it said i was going to make five million dollars and now we've only made three hundred thousand dollars like what the heck happened um so i think a lot of times you'll get anecdotal estimates from distributors, I know I oftentimes give them. I very rarely write them down, but certainly international sales agents do have a specific um, ask and a take for each individual territory. I think that's really good to know, and that's a good, nice perspective to hear. Um, well, I think this is about time that to, to wrap things up. First off, Kristen, thank you so much for giving so much of your time and expertise today and so much facts, so many facts. Um, <laughs> all the facts. Um, if anyone has any parting words or thoughts for, for Kristen or wants to uh, say anything to her, feel free to put it in the questions box and I'll read that out loud. And while you're doing that, um, Kristen, I think you didn't remember this from last time, but you know, we like to end these with just parting words of encouragement or thought. This is a pretty tough time in a tough industry and um, distribution is a hard to keep track of. Uh, anything you can leave people with as they're trying to approach this, the beast that is distribution? <laughs> That it's not the beast that you think it is. Ultimately, the the distribution is just another piece of the business. Um, I think the biggest takeaway um, is to really start working on building relationships with distributors because we are, in fact, here to be a, a resource for you guys. I think a lot of us want to start earlier conversations with filmmakers. We want to develop those relationships. I think wherever we can give information that helps you guys um, make your films and um, create better partnerships, it only helps all of us. So we're oftentimes willing to give input, to give feedback, um, to weigh in on value of, of cast, to weigh in on log lines. So, I mean, really, really think about distributors, not just as the end goal for your film, but potentially uh, really valuable, important sounding boards for you guys as you're putting your projects together. Um, and the biggest thing for us as, as distributors and me as a, you know, acquisitions person is that like, I never know where the next amazing project is going to come from. Like, yes, there's, you know, we all think that Sundance or Toronto or, you know, stuff that the big agencies are going to send us is, is going to be, you know, the best product, but that's just not necessarily the case. I've been surprised so many times by films that I just, that came out of left field, that just really tugged at my heartstrings. Um, so I think a lot of us are trained to to really be sure to look under every rock and cranny, does that make sense? Uh, every nook and cranny, uh, but really to, to look at every film that comes across our desk and, and be open-minded that the next amazing project could be, you know, something that comes from an unsolicited submission so just don't don't lose don't lose the faith keep keep going and um go with your gut and go with partners that seem to really get and understand your film i think at the end of the day a distribution relationship is a long one they're longer than most marriages and relationships um and we tend to get into them really quickly so i think it's important that as you guys are are navigating the landscape and choosing your distribution partners is to ultimately go with your gut and and choose people that you trust um or that you feel like are ultimately going to do right by you and do right by your film uh great i love that that's that's fantastic and the and the good reviews are coming in. Thank you so much. People are saying thank you. Great information. Thanks. Super insightful. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I love this. This was really great to hear. <laughs> uh, they're still coming in, but uh, yes, I'll add my own. Thanks again, Kristen. This was really, really helpful, and I think a, a great for people to hear your perspective on this and um, uh, have everyone be caught up what's going on. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to to be with you guys. I hope this was helpful. Good luck with all of your 
respective projects. Um, I look forward to hopefully meeting some of you guys in the not too distant future and be well. Yeah, thanks everyone. We'll see you um, all. Thanks, thanks everyone for being here. We'll see you at the next all uh, the next webinar and have a great uh, rest of your week and weekend. Thank you. Bye everyone.